Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Ted Ings, and uh, welcome very much. Uh, this is our live stream uh, to help Mother Seton Academy, and I would like to also welcome Cara Delane. Cara, yeah. good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ted. I'm so excited that I get to be a part of this today. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, it's not every day that we do this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just typically on Mondays, but um, um, you know, I'm happy to take the handoff so much uh, from Antonio ha uh, Harrison. I've been watching Antonio. Great job, Antonio. And uh, Cara, uh, Frank Lopes, who's a, a wonderful friend and his wife, Andrea, uh, they reached out to me uh, to help with this great cause. Their son, Preston School Elementary School, is in danger of closing. And uh, the pandemic has really affected fundraising for a lot of these uh, religious institutions and uh it's had a, an unfortunate offshoot, you know, if they have a, a school. So um, uh, we're raising some money to help uh, keep them in business. And it's a very worthy cause. And uh, Kara, thank you so much for being here. I know. I, I was thinking earlier when you were telling me about this and about this young man that, you know, his school might be closing down. I was thinking about how many, you know, businesses, schools, churches, whatever it may be that have struggled, you know, throughout the last couple of years. And I can't imagine being a, a young kid and, you know, getting word that the school that I was attending might, might possibly close and, you know, all your friends and all your teachers could possibly get split up and um, what that would do to somebody's youth and, and I'm just ecstatic to be able to be a part of this to help out and hopefully be able to save uh, the Mother Seton Academy because I know for me that would be extremely important as a young kid and, and I'm here to help. Yeah, and we've got going on in the scroll at the bottom here, everybody. Um, uh, we've got we've tagged Save Mother Seton Academy, which is the name of the elementary school. And you can donate right now at SaveMSA.com. SaveMSA.com. Uh, that will take you to a pay PayPal page. You can pay by credit card or by um, by PayPal, obviously. And Kara and I have just uh, made a donation on. Uh, our behalf and the Fixed Ops Roundtable of $1,000 uh, to help save uh, the school. So um, uh, we believe in the cause and we want to challenge everybody, even if you don't have $1,000, okay, whether it's $50, $100, $25, uh, to make a donation right now. And uh, please go to that uh, website at savemsa.com. And, um, you know, Kara, my daughter has gone to a private school uh, her whole life, except for college now, going to a public college. Mm -hmm. And she told me that, you know, in her freshman year of college, that she felt she was getting such a better education at the at the private uh, schools, especially, you know, the, the junior high and the uh, and the high school. Uh, Frank's son is in the seventh grade. And in New Jersey, it's not uncommon for an elementary, a private elementary school to go all the way up to eighth grade. So we yeah. uh, we want to keep that school open. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I never attended a, a private school in my lifetime, but I had quite a few friends and family members that did. And, and I could see the difference, um, especially the ones that were ran by, you know, a church community and, and whatnot. So um, I can't speak on behalf of him of how it feels to, you know, study at, at a private school, but I have seen the impact that it has on our communities. And I can only imagine um, what, how distraught these people are going to feel if this school closes down in their community. And before you and I were on this afternoon, I was watching Glenn Pesh, who's a very another revered person in automotive. And Glenn was making a good point that a lot of times class sizes are smaller at these private schools, Catholic schools. And he's right. You know, in a, in a public school, the class size is typically a lot bigger and, you know, you could get lost in that class size. And then, um, Frank was making, Frank Lopes, who's on also today, this afternoon, I was watching Frank, and uh, I look forward to getting a copy of your book, Frank, autographed, and I think Kara wants one, too, uh, yes. so, uh, you know, that's two copies, Frank. Um, <laughs> uh, the um, Frank Lopes was making the comment that, you know, once one, it's, it's not about one school, Kara, once one goes, another one goes, and another one goes, and there's a domino effect. In the town where I live in New Jersey, 
and you heard Mark Mickens talk about this on our recording yesterday. There's a uh, Catholic church, which I belong to, and there's a elementary school that's alongside the, um, the church. And the elementary school has been packed. I mean, it's been doing very well, um, but the church is not, right? Especially with what's happened in the last two years. So donations are way down. So what they did, Kara, they decided to close this elementary school and they closed it last summer. And uh, it's a beautiful school and it's empty now. And all these kids were going to school there. And I drive by and I'm like, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they closed the school. And same thing, it went to seventh and eighth grade. And, um, you know, so I, I feel for these kids, you know, that if their school closes, it's not just about that school. It's, it's going to be another one and another one and another one. So we really got to, you know, we really got to go all out, everybody. And we really got to help, um, you know, keep this elementary school open uh, for the kids and for the parents. And like you just said, you know, for the community as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be quite a few people watching us right now. And, and guys, we are live. <laughs> Sunday totally afternoon. live. Yep. And so, you know, if you're a parent um, out there or not a parent like I am yet, um, just think about the times that you were in school or maybe your kids attending school every day, whether they're having a great day when they come home or a rough day. They're still really blessed to be able to have that opportunity to go to school every single day. And I think that's something that we quite often probably take for granted and, and don't realize that there's a lot of young people around the world that don't have that opportunity to be able to go to a school at all. Or of course, one that's so beautiful that um, a lot of us are blessed to go to. So I can't imagine, you know, just having that, taken away. And, and I'm a huge believer in education and, and I will always advocate for that. And, and if we can keep impacting um, these young people at the Mother Seton Academy, then we need to help out guys because Ted is right. Um, just because it's not your school um, and your community being jeopardized right now, it doesn't mean that it couldn't be in the future. Um, so let's do our part now and, and start a movement that, you know, continues to uplift the education and and the power that our youth is going to have because they're going to impact our world one day and we need to we need to think about that in today's time very well said Kara and um you know tell us about your your upbringing and um and where you went to school you grew up in Texas but you didn't grow up in uh, the big city of uh of Houston or Dallas I, I remember you've said you know that uh you know, you grew up uh, in the um, in the country on a, on a in a farm community, right? I did, yes. So I grew up about forty five miles east of Lubbock, Texas. So if you don't know where that is, um, we're known for the Texas Tech Red Raiders, the Texas Tech University. There, um, it's not a huge place. It's growing because um, we have quite a bit of land to grow out. But I grew up about 45 miles east of there in a tiny, tiny town. Well, I didn't even grow up in the tiny town. I lived in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and anybody that truly knows me and know, knows my upbringing could attest to that. I lived about 10 miles from the nearest town. And that town was very small, had like a 1A school. And I attended that school for pre-K and half of kindergarten. My brother went through half of third grade and then we transferred to a little larger of a school, 30 miles um, east of us or west of us. Sorry. And it was an amazing school that uh, my mom actually attended. And um, my brother and I got to you know, grow up in that community. And, and it was a small school. Um, we were 2A and then we are now 3A. Um, but it was called Idaloo High School. Probably not many people watching is going to know where that is because it is a super small community. But um, I fell in love with it. And, you know, I I am a small town girl. And if I could raise my kids in a community like that, I would because it had a huge impact on me. I had small classes and I got to know my teachers very well and my principal very well, coaches very well, ag teachers very well. And there was probably no more than 
25 to 30 students in a class at one time. So I felt like my education was top notch because I did get that one on one level of learning from my teachers and my peers. And it was just nice to be able to grow up in a in a school like that, that, you know, you didn't have to worry about being seen or worry about, you know, not knowing what's going on, because it was such a small knit community that everybody was there to lend a hand. And I can remember certain times actually uh, growing up that, you know, tragic things would happen within our school district or Mm. um, certain families that attended school there. And I will never forget how our community would come together and all lend a hand, all pitch in, you know, whatever it may be. I, I was so impressed by so many different incidents like that that have stuck with me to this day. And I could, I could tell you off the top of my head, certain families that went above and beyond to help people that they might not even have known very well. And I still remember that to this day. I still attest, you know, some of my success today to some of the teachers that I had in my, my high school and, and junior high. And, and I just, I'll never take that for granted. I'll never forget how blessed I was to be able to attend a wonderful school and, and get to interact with wonderful people every single day and, and be part of a community that truly loves each other. So, um, I know, um, you know, my younger years of school were huge for me and all of my classmates as well. So that's why I'm here today because I want, I want to help the Lopes family and and their son, you know, be able to have the same experiences that I had. And, um, you know, you just talked a little bit about that. Oh, by the way, Frank, uh, Frank uh, made a comment here that uh, he can make that happen about the books. So uh, <laughs> we're looking forward to that, Frank. Um, and Michelle McLean here as well. We rise together, hashtag. Um, you know, as children, we're really, you know, the fact that you remember all these things that happened, right? The positive things that made a big impact on you. I would imagine that if your school were to close, you know, you'd remember that you know, maybe even more. Okay. And that would have the opposite, you know, effect on the children. Yeah. I, I can't imagine. And I have no doubt that within my small little community in the middle of a farm town, that if that school was, you know, saying that they were going to close down, that there would be people like this today that did everything in their power and did everything possible gathered people near and far to help make sure that that did not happen because that's how much we loved our community and loved that school. And, and so I know what these people are feeling right now. And, and I have no doubt that I would have done it for my community. So if I can do it for somebody else's community, it's just even better. Yeah. And um, that was really more of a farm community, was it not? Or farming community? You know, yeah. what, how should I say that? Yeah, so um, pretty much all cotton um, around there. There's a little bit of grain and corn near there too, but predominantly um, in West Texas, it's all cotton. Um, that's what my dad does for a living too. So yeah, near and far, you could see cotton fields for miles. <laughs> I think I've seen a poster too that you had on there and you're right. All you can see is the cotton field. So that's, yeah. you grew up with that. Yeah. And I loved it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I think I've told you before, that's something that um, a lot of people don't know about me to this day that have only known me in the last few years since I jumped into automotive. And yeah, I may look like this glam city girl from time to time, but um, yeah, I grew up on in the middle of a cotton field and I raised sheep and we had some cattle. I even had some llamas, some miniature donkeys. Like I grew up basically on a zoo and (laughs) I loved it. Like I have such a love for agriculture and, and just a small town feel. And I think that's why I thrive in Madisonville, Texas, where our stores are now because I grew up in a place like that. Wow. What a perspective. (laughs) And, and, and by the way, it sounds like that education prepared you really well for, maybe you didn't, I don't think any of us have you know, planned, I'm going to go into automotive, you know, when I get a little bit older, right, and graduate. But I think it really prepared you well, 
you know, and gave you a lot of the basics, you know, you're, um, you're, you're well grounded. Let's just say that in, in my opinion. Yeah. I definitely think that I have a different outlook on the world than most people because I grew up in such a small farming community and, and, you know, growing up in a fourth generation cotton farming family wow. that, you know, every, every day that I sat down at the dinner table, um, to do my homework or, uh, eat with my family, um, they made sure that I appreciated the roof over my head. I appreciated mm. the clothes on my back and I appreciated the meal that I was about to eat as well. And to mm. realize where it really came from, like mom mm. didn't just go to the grocery store and pick that up. And I see everything like that um, in today's time. And I wish that more, more students and more young people had that opportunity that I had to be able to see the world a little differently and, and appreciate the little things that we utilize every single day. And, you know, if it wasn't for me growing up in that town, I would have never been exposed to that and, and been able to have such a wonderful appreciation and passion for the agriculture industry. But it sure did, uh, you know, I advocated for agriculture for so long and fell in love with speaking and then somehow stumbled into automotive. So I'm still talking just about something else that's also vital to our, our society to this day. But you're not just talking by chance because I believe you told me the story that when you were in school, you also spoke publicly uh, on behalf of the uh, agriculture uh, there. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not phrasing it just right, Kara. You're going to correct me. But um, you really got started with speaking in publicly and you were acknowledged, okay, for the great work that you did. There. Tell us about that because that also laid the foundation for where you are today. Yeah, so... Um, I actually had a very bad brain injury, um, cheerleading. I had a really bad cheerleading accident that um, I suffered a really bad brain injury from when I was 15. And I was so gung-ho. I was cheerleader, track star, basketball lover. And that, come, that came to a screeching halt because I had a really, really bad brain injury that contact sports and getting thrown in the air wasn't going to be an option anymore. So I took a hard left and I did something else that I was already involved in, but I just, it was about more to me at that point, because I was like, you know, maybe this was a blessing in disguise that I changed gears here and, and go dive into my FFA program because I already stock showed and I was getting involved in my FFA program. But yeah, I, I took that and ran with it. Um, came back from my brain injury and was able to memorize speeches finally and, and be able to speak correctly um, after I didn't for quite some time. Mm. And so that made me even want it even more because I had kind of a hurdle to get over at the start. And so, yeah, I, I took off and I fell in love with it. And if anybody knows me out there, they know that I'm extremely competitive and I don't like to lose. <laughs> so once I said, hey, I'm going to do this, I was going to do it at the best of my ability. And so I talked about agriculture um, in the state of Texas. I talked about it nationwide. And then I started winning um, contests actually within our community, um, all the way to state level, recognized on the national level for talking about production agriculture mainly. And then I got invited to... Um, it was the Texas Soil and Water Conservation Convention. Um, I got to speak at um, NRCS stuff, um, different conservation days. And I was able to speak in auditoriums of thousands of people. And I was about 17 years old. So I'm presenting to all these people about why um, everyone out there should be an advocate for agriculture. Because like I was saying earlier, some people don't realize that like, and it was something that I grew up in and that I have such a deep love for that I believe I still believe it to this day and I would go do it again today. And and then it in turn brought me a lot of success. I landed my first job because of a speech I said for um, Texas Farm Bureau, actually, and bought mm -hmm. a speech at one of their um, large meetings. And then they hired me after um, a couple of years down the road. They remembered me and I sent in my resume. And they called me and asked me if I was the same girl that spoke um, in front of them a few years ago. And so, yeah, I, I just kept running with it. And then 
decided I wanted to take it um, down maybe like the law path and ended up not doing that because I stumbled into automotive about the time I was chasing, chasing a law degree. And, and then I said, you know, law school can wait. I want to chase this stuff in automotive and see what impact I can have there. Like it did on the um, agriculture industry. And it looks like uh, Eric has shared this on the Henson brand uh, page. <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for doing that. And Frank, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, helping us uh, get that done as well. Um, talk to us about, after high school, college, you went to Texas Tech and you got a degree there. Tell us about that. Yeah. So um, after all of my <laughs> agriculture exposure of public speaking, I decided, you know, I had a lot of scholarships um, from awards that I won for my public speaking stuff. And majority of them, I had to study something within agriculture in college to be able to utilize that scholarship. If I went, wanted to go study kinesiology, I couldn't use that scholarship. And so I was talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. And, you know, when I finally sat down, I was like, it would be dumb of me not to utilize this scholarship, at least for my first couple of years and, and maybe decide later on if I want to make a career change um, and educational change. But I jumped in with agriculture communications at Texas Tech University and huge supporter of what they call CASNR, College of Agriculture Resources, uh, Natural Resources. And um, I would not be the person that I am today if I wouldn't have went there. Their, their dean is amazing. The teachers are amazing. And Texas Tech impacted me in such a positive way that I was able to, you know, not only expand my education, but expand my knowledge and in just real time world and get exposed to a lot of different people and be able to recruit for the school. And, and I did that um, on a national level too, and, and go out and speak to young students and, and, at, you know, really um, advocate for them to not only go to college, but, but what benefits Texas tech university had to offer and um, why they should study something in agriculture and why it was important. And I, I fell in love with that too. Yeah. So um, huge impact. And, you know, I, I considered going back to get another degree, but just didn't feel right at the time. But I loved, I loved Lubbock, loved Texas Tech University, and the education was second to none. And I would definitely encourage anybody out there to, to give Kasner at Texas Tech a chance because it is amazing. And it was a small town kind of feel within the ag college. So I like that even more. Everyone, we're interviewing Cara Delane here, and uh, we want to remind you all that it's a great opportunity to right now donate at SaveMSA.com, SaveMSA.com. Uh, Frank and Andrea Lopes, uh, their son Preston is attending the seventh grade, and that school is in jeopardy of being closed. Mm -hmm. So uh, we challenge you all to match our donation or to come as close as you can. Uh, Cara and I have donated on behalf of the Fixed Ops Roundtable $1,000 to keep this school open. And um, we need your help right now, everybody. Uh, Frank asked me earlier today, and I spoke with Andrea as well, and um, there's no more worthy cause than doing this. And uh, we're also learning a lot about Cara Delane. Cara, you got a four-year degree from Texas Tech, did you not? I did. I got a four-year degree in three years. So I sped it up quite a bit. Um, Actually, in my high school, I did um, some college classes to go into tech with um, a few classes under my belt and and to save myself some money in the long run. Financially, I was smart yeah. there. Um, and then I could have been there about three and a half years, but I decided towards the end of my college career that, you know, why would I hang around and, and stay there to party it up and do the whole college experience? Because I was ready to get out in the world and get out into society and start contributing to the world and making a difference and starting a career. And so I made that jump and I said, get me out of here. Um, let me power through. I want a high GPA. And, and so that's what I did. Wow. So, you know, all of this really may help make you into who you are today. And, um, you know, tell us a little bit about how you ended up at Henson brand and how that all came about, because you don't have the typical job at a dealership. Um, and you make what you do, Kara, 
you make it look fun and you make it look easy. And I know it's not. I know your hours are very long and you are, you have a, one thing I can tell everybody about Cara Delaney, what I've learned about her, she has an amazing work ethic. And I, I don't say that lightly, you know, she is there, you know, well, I don't know if she's required to be five days a week, but she is there every day. And she is, you know, it's not like she lives around the corner. Okay. She's got a commute and she goes back and forth and she gives her all. And it's not unusual. Like this past week, we see that Kara has been locked in the gates because she stayed <laughs> late at night and they've closed the dealership and they've got to come back and open those gates, Kara, to let you, let you back out to go home. Yes, they did. They did. Um, I love my, my job there. And, and, you know, I said that I stumbled upon that and I actually was taking my LSAT, uh, my entry exam for law school um, down in Houston uh, a few years back. And I'm called up a family friend, Shannon Pettis. She lives around the corner from me now. Okay. Um, and I hadn't seen her in years. She was friends with my mom and I knew that she lived down here. And so I called her after I took my LSAT and I was like, man, I've had a hard day. This test was so hard. Um, you want to meet up um, just to grab lunch. And she met up with me and I, I told her, Hey, I'm looking for a job, yada, yada. And, and she ended up calling Eric who she worked for at the time and said, I have found the girl for you. You've been looking for somebody with um, a communications background. And this girl had a, uh, just got a recent degree. And, and I think she would fit what you're looking for. And I met Eric a few days later and I told him during that interview, I said, I will not be here long, Eric. I want to go to law school. I just need a job to get, you know, um, me by for the next six months before I apply. And he said, okay, no worries. And it's been two and a half years now. I'd never even applied to law school and I had a good enough score on my LSAT that I could have. And I did, I don't know, something didn't feel right. And I got into this automotive thing and quickly got eat up with it. And I love my, my job there. I love the career path that I'm on and I see so much opportunity in it. And anybody out there watching that doesn't know much about automotive, I would, I would definitely encourage you to take, take a chance with it because it has blessed me in so many ways. I've got to uh, not only have a mentor like Eric, but gain another one in Ted and meet so many amazing people in this community and in the automotive industry. And, it's brought nothing but success and happiness for me. And I could not be any more grateful from that first day that, that I took a chance on it. And Eric is a great car man because he, uh, he realized early on that, okay, she said six months, but Eric, you knew, you knew that once she got a taste of it, you were likely to, um, you know, to, uh, to keep her and look, look how she has grown and blossomed, you know, into the, uh, into the super superstar of superstars at all automotive dealerships, no matter where you go, there's nobody who's got the presence that Henson brand dealerships as part of the foundation automotive group have. Uh, speaking of friends in the industry, we've got about two minutes left, Cara, and we're going to turn it over to our good friend, Michelle McLean, who's uh, there in the ticker with donate at MSA.com. Um, Tell us a little bit about what's next for you, Kara, uh, before we go and uh, turn it back over to Michelle. Yeah, so I'm excited to hear Michelle's piece too. But um, as we're on here, guys, you know that that Ted and I have a show every single Monday night um, at 8 p.m. And then also we're approaching here soon. We've got the next Fixed Stops Roundtable March Magic coming up on March 9th, 10th, and 11th. So um, if you want to grab tickets, you can over at FixedStopsRoundtable.com. Um, we're raising money there as well. Um, but today guys, I just want to encourage you. Um, we want to help out, um, the Lopes family. Oh, I see his comment down there. Um, <laughs> and it's done with their school. So guys, if you can donate, you know, even a dollar, it doesn't matter. Please, please click on that donation link and, and contribute what you can, because we do want to make an impact for their school. Everyone, it's all about Frank Lopes and Andrea Lopes today and their son Preston and their school. Uh, we ask you if you've got, as Kara said, even a dollar to donate, five dollars, 10, 20, 25, 50, 100, 500. Uh, go right now to help save Mother Seton Academy to save MSA.com and uh, make a donation there. You will be glad you did. And, uh, you know, look at the look at the wonderful 
young lady that's turned out, you know, as a result of, you know, growing up in a great community and a great school. And uh, we know the same is true with Preston, Preston Lopes. And, uh, you know, Kara, I think, uh, I think our job is done. It's not about the Fixed Ops Roundtable today. It's, uh, no. it's about the, the Lopes family and their school. Yep, so everyone go over to save msa.com right now and please donate so we can save this school. Okay, Kara, thank you so much. Uh, Andrea and Frank and Preston, thank you. And uh, we're going to turn it over to our great friend, We Rise Together, Michelle McLean. So we'll see you on Michelle's page.